Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Ripple Effects of Conflict, the Worsening Global Food Insecurity and Malnutrition Crisis. Just a quick announcement that closed captions are available should they be helpful. I am Reverend Eugene Cho, co-chair of the United States CEO Council for Nutrition and president and CEO of Bread for the World, a collective Christian voice of advocates in every U.S. congressional district who urge our nation's decision makers to change the policies and programs to allow hunger and malnutrition to persist. We are here to talk about how the Russian invasion of Ukraine has exacerbated problems the world was already just managing, including the impacts of COVID-19, climate change, and conflict in many countries, to the point that we are headed toward a food and nutrition crisis that will affect every nation. Before the invasion of Ukraine, the decades long decline in hunger in the world that so many of us here work to support and in which the US government played a key part has already ended. 43 million people were at risk of famine, more than 283 million were facing severe hunger and malnutrition contributed to nearly half of all deaths of children under the age of five. The Russian invasion of Ukraine is making this situation worse. Here are some reasons why. Ukraine and Russia are critical food producers accounting for 30% of the world's wheat exports and over half of the world's sunflower cooking oil. Wheat futures traded, for example, in Chicago. The global benchmark recently rose to a record. Ukraine and Russia also supply core resources needed to manufacture fertilizer, Reduce fertilizer supplies and higher oil prices will increase costs for harvesting, transporting, and processing food. Consumers in countries with lower incomes spend more on food as a portion of their incomes and so are most affected when food prices rise. Within those countries, the most vulnerable individuals will be affected first and most for example, women and girls often eat last and least, even during peacetime. A crisis like this will make them more vulnerable. In the evenings, I often watch the news on the television with my family sitting next to my father, who lived, endured, and survived the Korean War. He lived in a refugee camp. He was separated from his family he experienced extreme hunger during that conflict. I see the footage from Ukraine and I hear about so many people experiencing what my father once did. And I think to myself, we can do something about this. In fact, we must do something about this. This moment can be a catalyst for change. Uh, the US government contributed to the great exodus from hunger that our world was experiencing just a few years ago and can be a part of the solution to this situation too. We know that investments in humanitarian assistance and development assistance are effective in combating crises, both in the immediate term and by creating resiliency so that the world is better equipped to face future crises. That is what we are going to talk about today. I am grateful for the Senate Hunger Caucus role in demonstrating US leadership to combat food and nutrition security crises around the world and thank them for co-hosting today's event. Special gratitude to Senators Jerry Moran of Kansas, Sherrod Brown of Ohio, John Boozman of Arkansas, Bob Casey of Pennsylvania, and Dick Durbin of Illinois, all of whom have long histories of helping change history for people experiencing hunger through their actions in the Senate. Thanks also to my colleagues at the US CEO Council for Nutrition, today's other co-hosts for making this event possible. A list of organizations who are part of the Nutrition Council can be found at nutritionceocouncil.com. Today, three experts will share their perspectives on the global food crisis. We will then spend about 20 minutes in a moderated Q&A 
As you have questions or thoughts throughout the morning, please put them in the chat. We'll answer them as many as we can and staff will follow up after with all those that we don't get to. Now, if you don't mind, please take a moment right now to introduce yourself in the chat. Put your name, where you work, where you're located, and that would be helpful. It's not the same as being in a room together, but hopefully it'll give a little bit more of a sense of connection with each other because all of us and our voices and our influences matter. Now, while you're doing that, we will kick things off with a short video about how flaws in our global food system make it hard to nourish the people who need it most. Again, thank you so much for joining us. Esther stands by her small crop of maize with hope. She is a single mother, and the food she grows is how she provides for her family. Each growing season begins with hope. Hope for sun, hope for rain, hope for a good yield. Many smallholder farmers are women like Esther who feed not only their communities, but also produce much of the world's food. Unfortunately, flaws in our global food system mean that much of this food can't nourish the people who need it most. Instead, it is often wasted or lost, unsafe to eat, or lacks the nutrients required for a healthy diet. Esther and her children are among three billion people worldwide who are malnourished because they simply can't access a healthy diet. A problem that disproportionately affects women and girls. She tends to eat last and the least in her household and often goes to bed hungry. As Esther looks out over her field, she knows that climate change threatens her harvest, reducing the quality and quantity of the food she produces for her family and community. Still, she sees a bright future. We can help build better food systems that increase access to nutritious food, improve food safety, and reduce food loss. Here's how that looks. Building better policies to ensure that food is safe to eat. Growing a wider range of nutrient-dense crops and fortifying staple crops so that people are not just full, but also fully nourished. Processing that extends the shelf life of nutritious food to help food reach more people with less waste and loss. Empowering women farmers to take charge of their harvest and their finances so they have the resources they need to feed their families. Investing in food systems so that the way we grow and produce our foods is better for the planet. When we support and empower women farmers like Esther, we don't just nourish her. We nourish her children and their children. We nourish her community. We nourish the planet. And we nourish the future. Well, again, thank you and welcome to those who may have just joined us during the video. Closed captions are available. And if you haven't done so already, please go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat. Uh, it's my uh, pleasure to introduce our first speaker. Dr. Arif Hussein, the Chief Economist for the World Food Program. He's going to help us set the scene for the humanitarian crisis we now face and talk about food insecurity and malnutrition before the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, Dr. Hussein, thank you again so much for joining us. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Eugene. Um, thank you for the opportunity to come and talk about this really, really important and um, something which is which is not only devastating for for Ukraine, but the repercussions of which we are seeing all around the world. Uh, let me start by saying that this unwanted war um, is not happening in a vacuum. World was already in trouble. Um, we were already looking at food prices, which were at a ten-year high. We were already looking at fuel prices, which were at a seven year high. We were looking at countries 
um, 31 countries already experiencing inflation over 15%. We were looking at countries where in currencies have devalued in about at uh, over 15% in one year in 22 countries. Uh, we were looking at big job losses because of COVID, as many as still 52, 55 million job losses in 2022 as projected by IMF. We're looking at low income, 60% um, of low income countries under high debt stress, which is essentially doubled since 2015. And we are looking at a situation where countries big and small had spent upwards of $26 trillion in the 18, first 18 months of COVID dealing with the disease and its economic consequences. So this is, this is kind of like some, the, the environment on top of which now we have to deal with the consequences of, of this war. We know, Eugenia said it yourself, we have uh, you know, food prices at all time high. We have fuel prices on you know, nearing all time high or at least extremely wonder, uh, volatile over $100. Uh, we have fertilizer prices. So it is not about only what is happening right now, but when fertilizer prices are where they are, we're also talking about production for the next year. We are also looking at uh, basically extremely thin markets. I mean, this is one problem which we face uh, and it becomes big when there is a shock that our basic crops, whether it is wheat, whether it's coarse grains like millet and sorghum, whether it's corn, whether it's rice, whether it's soybean, they're produced by very, very few countries. And the stocks, the reserves are held by even fewer countries. So when there is a shock to any of these, we see mega consequences of that, not only for those countries, but outside of those countries. So, one question which people have already you know, asked me several times since this started, that look, we have been here or we were here as a high food and fuel crisis in 2008 or in 2011. So what's different about this one? And, uh, and I've, I've been saying that this is way worse than what we have experienced before. And the reason being, let's compare it to 2008, First and foremost, in 2008, we didn't have COVID, number one reason. But also in 2008, we didn't have a war in Syria. We did not have a war in Yemen. We did not have a war in Ethiopia. We did not have a conflict in Northeast Nigeria. So believe it or not, it did not look like that in 2008, but the world was a lot more secure. Even on the climate side, in the last 10 years, we have seen higher intensity of climate shocks. We have seen bigger frequency of climatic shocks. And when you put all of this together, meaning climate, meaning COVID, meaning uh, conflict, you can see very clearly that this is probably, uh, I'll take that back, not probably, this is the worst I have seen and worse than many of us have seen since World War II. In terms of what is happening, uh, you know, how, how, we, how we define this, again, we have started to call it, it is, a, it is a crisis of four Cs. You have the conflict, you have the climate, you have the COVID, and you had the rising costs. And now on top of that, you have three Fs, which are food, fuel, and fertilizer. And the combined effect of that means that if we don't act and act soon, millions of men, women, and particularly children are at risk. And this is not just saying, we are seeing things like that. I will just give you one example of that, um, what is happening in East Africa, particularly in the Somali region of Ethiopia. That reminds me, the the, the the films which are coming out of there, the news which is coming out of there reminds me of 2011 Somalia famine, where according to John Hopkins, 260,000 people died. But guess what? Of those 260,000 people who died, half of them died before a famine was declared. 
So bad things are happening right now. And we, as World Food Program on the front line, not only have to save lives, but we have to tell everybody that what we are seeing out there and the urgency which is there in order to deal with that. Now, coming back to, to again, to the numbers, let me just tell you how these numbers are continuously rising. Eugene, you said last five years, I will just pick numbers from 2019 onwards. As World Food Program, we are present in 81 countries. At the end of 2019, we had about 150 million people who were facing crisis level of hunger. In 2020, because of COVID, that number jumped to 272 million, same 81 countries. In 21, went up to 283 million. And this year, we were hoping that as things open up and situations are getting better, this number will come down. And our, according to our first assessments, we were at 276 million. And then Ukraine happened. And looking at we, when Ukraine happened, we, as everybody else, we did two scenarios. One was call it an optimistic scenario. Another one was uh, call it more now realistic scenario. And uh, in terms of how many more people would become acutely hungry because of this crisis. And according to the more realistic scenario, we expect another 47 million people to become acutely food insecure going forward in this year. So now if you take the 276 million who were already food insecure and you add to them the 47, you end up at 323 million people. These are acutely food insecure people. This is, I'm not talking about chronic food insecurity. And it is our responsibility to make sure that we save their lives and hopefully we can also change their lives. Also wanted to talk about what we have been doing. It is easy to say what we have to do, but it is also important for people to understand what we have done over the last three years. 2020, the, the year of COVID, we reached a record 115 million people despite COVID record in our 60 year history, 128 million in 2021, again a record. And this year we need to reach upwards of 145 million people. In order to do that, we need $20 billion. Many of may know that we are voluntarily funded. The United States is our biggest donor by far. And what we are seeing right now is a 50% gap, upwards of 50% gap in our funding, meaning what we need to help people save lives in comparison to what do we, ex we expect to get, which is about 10 billion. At the same time, what we are seeing is that our requirements, the costs, whether it be because of the supply chain, whether it be because of the commodities, if we were to do exactly what we did in 2019, it will cost us 44% more today than it was costing us in 2019. Put in numbers, that means every single month this year so far, we need $71 million more. That $71 million, you know what that is? That is enough to feed almost 4 million people with a single daily ration per month. This is the, the situation in which we are going forward. And I cannot emphasize more the urgency with which we need funds and the urgency with which we need access. In terms of what we are asking the world, first and foremost, please give and give generously. If we have money and if we have access, if we could do it in 2020, we can do it in 2022 as well. We are also talking about, Massimo will talk about this as well. We're talking about keeping trade open, minimum disruptions to supply chains. We're talking about additionality of resources, not redistribution of resources. We're talking about staying away from things like export restrictions and import bans. 
We are talking about exemption of humanitarian export uh, assistance from export bans. We're talking about transparency in markets so we can minimize some of the volatility by having information at one time in terms of stocks, in terms of production, in terms of trade. And frankly, above all, we are talking that countries big and small need to rethink their energy policies and their agriculture policies to diversify. Because if we don't, we will get out of this one. But again, we will be in trouble when the next crisis hits. And last but not least, we are talking about helping governments. Look, we are humanitarian assistance. We feed 140, 45 million people, fine. But this crisis is about the world. So poor countries need help. Poor countries in debt. Most affected countries, they need help to secure food today, to secure fuel today, and also to make sure that there is fertilizer today. So next year, we don't have a bigger shock than we already have today. Eugene, thank you for the opportunity, and I will stop here. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Hussein, thank you so much. Uh, I suspect that people uh, may have some questions and we want to encourage them to put them in the chat and we'll come back to you later. Uh, thank you for that sobering but also useful picture. Uh, one of the quotes that you mentioned that I think will stick with me is, uh, there is a list of what we need to do and also what we did. That it's not just us aggregating data and information but also making sure that all of us are actually doing our part. 323 million people um, experiencing acute food insecurity as we speak. Thank you again. Uh, our next speaker will move us forward in time to focus on what the world looks like after the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So we have a little bit of the before and now the after. And joining us is Dr. Maximo Torero Cullen, Chief Economist of the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Uh, Dr. Cullen, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, and I will do two things, uh, not only looking at the after, but also bringing some of the numbers, which I think are important uh, for what, is, what Arif was describing and what I assume Joe will also look at. So let me let me first uh, start with with uh, what is the the reason why this is so so important, and I think it's not just a few countries produce a lot of countries produce. You will find smallholders producing everywhere. The problem is uh, which are the key exporting countries. That that's what what matters uh, the most and what we need to look at. So what I am showing here is what are the the key exporting top exporting countries top ten for wheat for barley for maize, uh, for rape seeds, and for sunflower. Yellow and green are, yellow is Russia Federation, green is Ukraine. And you will see that Russia Federation and Ukraine play a crucial role in wheat, first and fifth, uh, third in terms of, of barley for the case of Ukraine, uh, and fourth in the case of Russia Federation. And for maize, uh, uh, we also have a, a role for both Ukraine and Russia Federation, but in oil seeds, it's enormous. Uh, they both uh, produce 52 or 53% of the world production of sunflower and 63% of the exports in the world. So the role is huge. Anything that happens to these two countries, as we are observing, will have a significant effect on, on the availability of food and, of course, on prices. But the major problem, uh, which also Arif was referring to, is fertilizers. And in fertilizers, the major role is of Russian Federation. No? It's the first exporter of, of N fertilizer, the third in the world of P and the second in the world of K. So what this means is that, and what is happening today, Russia Federation has closed the exports of fertilizers to the world. If this don't apply to the world when we already were in a world where fertilizer prices were increasing substantially, that means that the next planting season is at severe risk. I, I was in the Latin American Regional Con Conference, key exporters like Brazil, uh, Argentina, Paraguay, Uruguay of cereals were significantly constrained. Uh, high value commodity exporters like Peru, Chile, Ecuador were also constrained. The same is happening here in Africa and in South Asia, for example. The only commodity which is doing well, which is rice, because there is enormous pro production, is also facing a challenge now because of the lack of fertilizers for the next planting season, which is central for a country like Bangladesh, for example, that is now self-sufficient. But if they don't have the fertilizers, that will be very broken. Now, 
here I'm just giving you as an example, of course, uh, the major countries that are uh, affected are the North Africa, South Asia, a few countries in South Asia, but also Sub-Saharan Africa. And in red here, you have all the Sub-Saharan Afri African countries and the shares of how much they are import dependent. Uh, the advantage for Sub-Saharan Africa is that they also have another staple, which is uh, cassava. But again, fertilizers could affect that. But this is the distribution uh, of, of the shares. And most importantly, if we look to fertilizers, you will see that Sub-Saharan Africa is hugely dependent despite, despite of the plant that they have in Nigeria. But also you will see that Latin America is hugely dependent. And these are, Latin America is one of the world's key exporters in the world uh, of cereals and high value commodities. So if the next planting season is not good, then the choke will be exacerbated. Now, how we are looking at this, and this is starting to move to, to the future. So we're looking at three types of risks, uh, the food and agricultural risks, the macro risk, and the humanitarian risks. And Arif has talked about the humanitarian part. We divided it in three parts, what is happening in Ukraine for the people fighting the needs of food security, what is happening with the people moving out of Ukraine, displacement and, and uh, refugees, and what is happening in the, in the high risk countries, which are highly import dependent, but also in significant risk of food insecurity through the IPC phase. Those are the three boxes and we're looking to policies to reduce those risks in these three boxes. But in terms of the food and agriculture, the major concerns are, for us at least, is input supplies and production. So if the next planting season doesn't happen in, in, in Ukraine, which seems to be the case, because even they don't have access to tractors because of fuel, uh, and we have developed an assessment of the infrastructure, which is extremely damaged at this point. Uh, if that doesn't happen, then production of, of Ukraine will be affected. If a uh, Russian Federation cannot import seeds and, and pesticides from Europe, for example, they depend 60% uh, on Europe uh, exports, uh, then Russia Federation will also lower their supply for next year, not this year, but for next year. And that will imply that we will remove from the equation for 2023 a significant share, 30% of cereals and 63% of oil seeds, assuming the, the extreme, no? Uh, and that will be dramatic for the world. There is no way that other key exporters will be able to supply that, even worse with the problem that we are facing today on fertilizers. The other concern is trade and, and constraints to trade. So if countries start to put export restrictions like they happened in 2007, 2008, and 2011, then the situation will get even worse in 2022. Uh, 2022, if the war stops tomorrow, as I will show, uh, is not so dramatic. Prices have increased, but 2022 could be okay, assuming that most of the exports from Russia happen and part of the exports from Ukraine happen. But the major concern is next year, uh, and that will be reflected in prices and the logistical part. But one other issue which is important is the disease outbreak, uh, because Russia and uh, Ukraine it still has African swine fever and other zoonotic diseases. So if animals and livestock is pushed out of Ukraine because of the conflict, that could affect border countries in Europe and that could also create a significant problem to food security. In terms of the macro chops, uh, we, we will discuss uh, energy fertilizers, which is a different to the issue of fertilizers in 2007, 2008. Here is more complex, is linked also to climate change because of the change in the energy mix and have been increasing uh, as energy increases, the price of fertilizers will increase. Uh, and now we also have the problem of biofuels because oil per barrel is higher than $100, therefore biofuels becomes again a significant demand. And then there are clear policies that developed countries can put, which is basically reducing subsidies to, to biofuels and adjusting mandates to avoid again a competition. This is not the time at this point to have a competition between food and biofuels, like what happened in 2007, 2008. But then there is the issue that most of the vulnerable countries because of COVID-19 has been indebted significantly and they have less capacity to get any type of debt. What the G20 did in terms of not paying uh, interest is now over uh, and we need to see if this can be expanded. But the situation is critical because countries that are net food importers will have an increase in their import bill, not only because of the increase in prices, but also because of the devaluation of their exchange local currencies. And I will show some examples of that. That means that they will need more resources and they don't have those resources, so they are in a critical situation. So what to do? You know, countries like Lebanon, for example, they don't have the resources to be able to increase and to pay the increase in the import bill. They even they don't have uh, the storage capacity, right? And then the last element that we are concerned is nuclear contamination. Why? Because if there is an spread of, 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 of nuclear residues in, in, in the land of Ukraine, that means that the land is off production for 10 years. And that means that we are re reducing uh, the export capacity in the world, as, uh, taking uh, the Ukraine out of the equation. And this is not out of, of a possibility. Now, the humanitarian risk, I think Arif already discussed them. Three elements for us. 
Uh, FAO has a huge team on the on the ground working in Ukraine, trying to find ways. Our job is is to help to try to see what planting can happen for next season to assure that at least for the people in Ukraine there is some food security, uh, and of course to help in the design of transfer and cash transfer programs to to help members, but also to help neighborhood countries. And our major concern is also all the countries which are at risk, as, as Arif also mentioned. The energy fertilizer uh, elements are important because uh, the channels of transmission uh, of higher energy prices to the agricultural sector. And uh, as the higher energy prices increase, and this is where we need to start to think on trade-offs. No? We fully agree with the idea that we need to create an energy, a change in the energy mix to move out of, of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, but also we need to understand that this could have a significant cost on prices of fertilizers and that could have a significant cost on human lives because of food insecurity. So we need to assess those trade-offs and see what are the options and what are the solutions to that. What we know clearly is that the increase in energy prices will increase the prices of fertilizers and that has a correlate in food, in food prices. No? Uh, and again, we, or we need to start thinking on substitutes, but that's nothing, something that won't happen in the short term, it will take some time to happen, and that's why we need to be very careful. This is the story. Natural gas prices has been going up, and as a result, this has affected fertilizer prices. There is a little uh, light in the tunnel, which is uh, prices of natural gas uh, are reducing, but that's not enough to assure the margins that are needed. And the major concern of this is that uh, if we look at accessibility, affordability, of farmers, so affordability of fertilizers, you will see that affordability is going substantially down and is going a lot more than what farmers can cope with the current prices. And this is not only at the global level, but it's also by commodity. The same happens in wheat, in rice, very important in rice because this is the thinnest market. If something happens to the planting season, we will be in trouble next year, maize, sugar, soybeans, and also in palm oil. Now, the city issue that I was referring to, here I'm showing uh, in this area chart uh, the rubrics of pesticides and herbicides. But the most important thing that I want to bring is the dependency. So here again, uh, you will see that Russia Federation depends enormously on uh, European Union imports of pesticides and seeds. So if sanctions are put to avoid that, which up to now they are not, uh, and also the US have removed the sanctions on, on fertilizers, uh, that could be dramatic because that means that uh, the, the, the Russia Federation for 2023 won't be able to have a proper planting season. Now, of course, the, the reason why I'm raising this is that I understand the concept of, and the reason of the sanctions, but it's important to understand that this could have a double sword because it could create a bigger pressure and a create a food crisis, which is another instrument of war that we could be falling on by, by doing sanctions. So our recommendation here is to properly assess them uh, so that we avoid these type of things. Now, price risks. As I said, if we stop uh, today the war, the pending exports on wheat are 8 million metric tons from Russia, 6 million metric tons for, for Ukraine. Just to have in context, India has increased exports by releasing reserves in 7 million metric tons. So this shouldn't be too dramatic if the war stops today. Uh, in May, it's 14 million metric tons uh, in Ukraine and 2.5 million metric tons in, in the case of, of, of Russian Federation. Now, Again, this could be covered by the US or other countries. So if the war stops and still these countries can export the residual exports that they have this year, it should be, it should be okay. But sunflower is a different story. 56% of the production, 53 and 62% of the exports, this is a problem. And that's why some countries are putting export restrictions on palm oil like Indonesia, which is increasing the price, making the price increase. And what we are observing today is that prices are skyrocketing the food price index of FAO released last Friday is the highest in history since the creation of the food price index, both in real terms and nominal terms. So we need to do things. And, and we simulated some of the impacts. We have a moderate shock and a severe shock. Moderate is 10 million metric tons out of wheat and maize. And severe shock is 25 million metric tons. So it adapts to the residual plus some more reduction because of the mobility and logistical issues. And also we cut uh, exports of other coarse grains and oil seeds. The impact of this, of course, will be an increase in price over the trend, which was already positive. But the most important impact in terms of security is that we will have 7.6 million people in the moderate to 13.1 million people under more severe shock, which is where we are moving right now. Now, I remember, this is in addition to the positive trend that we have. Like because of COVID, we estimated 161 million chronic undernourished. Uh, Arif was talking of acute food insecurity, which is more a short term uh, mission, which could end in chronic undernourishment. But this will be an increase on 13.1 million over a number which we know in 2022 uh, will be higher like that. 
So what are the recommendations that we're looking for here? Uh, of course, the first one is to support vulnerable people and vulnerable groups. Uh, keep trade open is central for food, for fuel, fertilizers, and inputs. Uh, we need to analyze sanctions, the pros and the cons, and the costs and benefits, as I mentioned before. And there has been a lot of progress on that. Uh, we need to avoid ad, ad hoc policy reactions and export restrictions. I am just in the African conference and I was telling them the worst they can do is to subsidize fertilizers because it will be diluted so quickly because of the increase in prices. While if they follow what Ethiopia did, soil maps to improve the blending, which can be done very fast now, that could increase effectiveness and allow them to cope at least in part and gain some bigger yields by using the proper mix of NPK. We need to diversify supplies, prepare for the African swine fever potential outbreak, uh, the nuclear risk and strengthen market transparency. And that's where Amy's plays a role. And of course, we need to create a reconstruction plan. Uh, at FAO, we have launched uh, seven initiatives. Uh, the first one is a global food import facility because we believe it's essential right now to help countries which are in a critical situation, that they don't have access to funding because of the debt that they have. And then they, they need to cover the import bill because if not, they will end into social unrest. And we are tracking that very closely. We need to, to also uh, respond to the Ukraine crisis, social protection, as I mentioned before, through emergencies, assess the investment needs to the reconstruction, the conflict uh, and animal health issues. And we also need to assess food insecurity. So another key policy for us is to launch emergency fees, food insecurity experience scale to identify where the hotspots of food insecurity are at the subnational level so that we can advise countries how to target the safety nets rather than to put in a straightforward policies. Like for example, my country was reducing the indirect tax to sales to certain commodities. That is, that is regressive because basically it applies to everybody the same. While if they knew where the hotspots of food insecurity are, they can target those rather than reducing a generic tax that will be counterproductive for the for the returns and, and, the, and, the, and the country recaudation. So, so it's something that we need to look at. And then the soil maps, which we believe is extremely important to increase efficiency. Now, uh, how we can, I, I will, uh, the humanitarian response, our assessments has three, three elements. First is maintaining food production uh, through providing cash and inputs and cereal. Second, to support the agri-food supply chains and, and markets by engaging with governments and private sector. And this is inside Ukraine. And third, coordinating the food security and livelihoods clusters together with WFP and others. But in terms of the, of the food financing facility, I just bring here some of the issues of the import bill and how it's changing. Look at the, at the colors here. This is for Sub-Saharan Africa, just as an example. Uh, if we compare the, the import bill between 2021 and 2019, there are cases in which it's over 50%. Even if we compare 2020, where prices were already high in 2021, we have cases which are over 30% of increase in import bill. So if we implement this type of import facility, in the case of Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, this will be the countries that could enter quickly and we can cope with the risk that they are facing right now. So these are the types of ideas that we need to move very fast uh, to be able to assure. And we need to have very clear criteria. Uh, and, and just to give you an idea, to cover the, the lower bound of, of this risk of import, of import bill, we're talking of $2.5 billion, which is 1% of the SDRs being released by the IMF. So there is a huge potential to, to do. The maximum is $25 billion globally, but it's a revolving fund. So it will allow to continue over time, increasing resilience uh, for the future. But th these are the types of, of ideas that I believe we need to start thinking very quickly to avoid IFIs moving very fast into policies that could not necessarily be good and could not be learning from what happened in the past and could create bigger distortions and increase the problem rather than solving the problem. Uh, thank you very much. I stop there. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Cullen. Um, very helpful. Thank you for the parallel data and science to support all the recommendations that you're making. I also want to thank our participants for their um, contributions, for questions. We will attempt to get to them at the end of our time. Uh, our third speaker is Dr. Johan Swinnen, Director General for the International Food Policy Research Institute and Global Director for CGIAR Systems Transformation Science Group. Uh, he will talk about current trends and issues and what we learned from the last global food crisis. Uh, Dr. Cole, uh, Dr. Swinnen, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Eugene. Um, it is uh, always a, a privilege and a challenge to be on the panel with, with Maximo. Uh, 
because Maximo has uh, covered uh, so many of the material already on, on the issues today. And of course, also your introduction and uh, the, the movie and the presentation by Dr. Hussein have covered a lot of material. So I uh, was anticipating a, a bit these things and I'm, I'm gonna uh, cover, uh, focus more on, on, on a number of broader issues, I would say a long-term uh, picture on, on what is going on and um, related to obviously to the current uh, challenges that we face, but also to uh, our policy framework or mindset of, of looking forward on this. Um, uh, Dr. Hussein already referred to, he called it the, the four C's. I have three C's here, climate change, COVID and conflict, which if we would go back a couple of years, I mean, the world was, was quite different. And let me uh, give you a bit of perspective on that. But next slide, please. Um, this is something where everybody has referred to, but maybe not as explicitly. I think we are facing massive challenges right now, uh, particularly the, the urgent one are related to, to food insecurity. But we all know that we have to see this in, in a broader set of, of, of challenges, which relate to health nutrition, the quality of the food, uh, resilience of our systems, the inclusiveness. I mean, who is at risk within our, our societies, who is more at risk in our societies? We know that it is not even. There's a lot of inequality issues here, both in terms of income um, across the world globally, but also within countries. And of course, with social groups, uh, for example, uh, I think Dr. Hussein also referred to this thing. Uh, so uh, this could be ethnic group, this could be gender issues, et cetera, are important. Sustainability, obviously, and the efficiency of our system going forward. All of these issues are important. And it's important that we don't lose track of this, this broader perspective, I think, when we are now trying to deal with, with the crisis issues facing us. And that we use this, this one, one of the key points I would like to make is that we should use the, the challenges, the crisis moment of, of, of the current moment to think about how we can make changes which are not pre uh, preventing moving or, or transforming our, our food system as a whole in this broader framework, but actually encouraging trying to find win-win situations in, in this perspective. Next slide, please. To give you a bit of a broader perspective, this is a cover page from The Economist from 2013, okay? And so there the story is, the lead article is, we are moving out of poverty in the world, okay? So this is not long ago, it's less than 10 years ago. Next slide, please. And if we looked at the numbers from, these are numbers from, uh, from FAO, which I'm sure most of you know well, there if you look at the number of uh, malnourished people in the world and the percentage of the population of that boat were going very much along the same lines as, uh, as the cover of the economist story. Next slide, please. What we have seen is that there's been a dramatic uh, turnaround in this thing. So first there's been a stabilization of these numbers around the middle of last uh, decade, and these numbers have gone up, okay? And they are even going up higher if you have the most recent data as, as where Maximo referred to. Um, next slide, please. And so that means we're on a particular point in history, which I think is, is really crucial to understand. If you look at broader numbers than just the number of, of undernourished people, we look at, at the quality of, of their food in terms of whether they can afford the healthy diets, where they have micronutrient deficiency and increasing other problems, also the, the growth of obesity in the world. And then you see that many of the poorest countries and also the ones which are potentially hit hardest now are in this thing where they don't only face one problem of nutrition, but they face several problems of nutrition simultaneously. Next slide, please. If we briefly uh, link some of these trends which has been going on, we've seen that the, the growth in, in uh, or the, the, the reversal of the trends, first to the slowing down and then reverse, is associated, is correlated strongly with the decline in income and GDP growth per capita. Particularly in the poorest countries, you see the orange line represents the, the numbers for Africa. And there you see it's there's a very strong correlation with the slowdown in economic growth and these uh, reversal. Next slide, please. Another factor where uh, Dr. Hussein referred to quite explicitly is the growth and actually the quite dramatic growth in the number of people which are forcibly displaced. These are people who have to leave their homes and their villages, their towns because of conflict. And you see that particularly again in the last decade, these numbers have gone up. I, uh, I'm not sure if you see the, the, the years on your screen, but where the trend changes is in the 2010, so the last decade again, a very strong growth. Next slide, please. We also know, of course, that these things are related to climate change, but I've put this slide in just to make the point that the crisis that we see in our food systems are 
have very unequal effects. This is an example. I could have uh, taken a whole series of uh, slides which have done studies. I just wanted to use this for illustration. And that is what we see. These are the impacts of COVID-19 from in Africa, particularly in the study we did in Ethiopia. And what we see typically is that the impact in terms of incomes, the impact in terms of nutrition effect are much worse for the poorest and the middle income groups than for the richer groups, even in, uh, in, um, in low income countries, okay? And that is really important to keep in mind because we are, it's not just uh, these effects are not equally spread across groups. Typically what we also find, for example, in terms of COVID also that we see that, that, that women and children and uh, people who have to migrate for work were affected much more strongly than, than others. Next slide, please. Um, here are some numbers. This is from the, the global food crisis report of last year. This is uh, we have done some background work for that. FAO was heavily involved in this as well. And um, you see that the if you look here, there's a combination. This is food crisis effect. I mean, it's a, it's a more uh, acute indicator than, than the global, the, the more structural hunger or malnutrition indicators. And there you see that all of these three factors are really important. So the conflict and security, the weather related to climate change, and then the economic shocks in this case, if you look at 2020 numbers, very strongly uh, related to COVID-19, all of them have very high numbers and they have been uh, increasing over this, uh, uh, fluctuating over this, this period. And again, you can see from the map that they are uh, not equally distributed over the world, obviously, but concentrated very much in the poorest countries in the world. Next slide, please. Then on this is a point which uh, Dr. Hussein also made, and this is if we compare the these are data for the last 20 years in terms of the prices for both fertilizer, food and fuel. And so the point, why would the, the today's crisis be different from the ones that we had in 2007, 2008? And there are a number of reasons for that. And the one which I think is really important is that the COVID effects still linger. And so they linger both on, on, if you want, on the private side, private sector side, and on the public sector side. And private side means that people have depleted their assets in a number of cases, have had lower incomes, have already facing a food security problem because of COVID, and the current price crisis is in addition to that. Okay, And this was very different in 2007, 2008, where I showed that the growth numbers, the income numbers were much better. Hunger and malnutrition were already on the rise, the structural uh, transformation, structural change that I indicated. And on the public sector side, uh, that's something where uh, Maximo Torero also referred to, that governments are cash trapped because of the expenditures, because of the, the investments they did, they made the health programs they financed uh, in response to COVID. And of course, we don't know, and it's a big uncertainty here, how long this, this will last, obviously. Next slide. The point, this is the same slide, but now in a bit of a historical perspective. And so on the left hand side, you see the numbers, the, the food prices since 1960. And what we see uh, there, okay, was that until, let's say, the year 2005, okay, we had one price spike in 60 years, okay. So the norm was relatively stable, uh, real food prices. And with one spike, what we see since 2000 is the inverse. Okay, we see a continuity of, of spikes of big volatility uh, happening on the right hand side. And so now it seems that the normal situation is volatility, is spikes, and that stability is actually uh, not a rule, but the but the opposite, the exception in this. And if this is um, a signal of what is to come, or or and that we expect this to continue, that means we have to have a total rethink. I think of or global food policy uh, and nutrition policies, which are related to that, okay? Next slide, please. And so this is my last slide I, I'm using, uh, I'm going back to the opening slides and just to put uh, things back in, in, in a longer term historic perspective, which we have made major, major progress uh, until the middle of last uh, uh, decade, really, in terms of reducing undernourishment in the world. And so the question now is, and this is really a question for us, okay, we as, as a community, uh, a global community, have to uh, make the choices, important choices to prevent us going back, to prevent us losing all the gains that we have made and to reverse the and make 
try to make that what we've seen for the past 10 years where we're in right now is an historical perspective will be a, a blip or a hiccup if you want to see it rather than a reversal of the trend. I mean, this is really a crucial set of decisions that we have to take, I think, going forward. And again, I mean, Maximo and, um, and Dr. Hussein already went in detail to some of the key policy issues related to trade, related to public subsidies, social programs, etc. I'm not going to repeat this here for, for time reasons. But I think, again, what we need to think about is we have to be careful that the, the decisions we take now in the short term are not preventing long term structural adjustments to it. It's more sustainable and a more re a resilient food system. But we have to try to make sure that these are consistent, that we, we create win wins and that the trade offs are, are minimized. There will be trade offs, there's always trade offs, but we try to minimize these and think about using the crisis that we have now also as an opportunity to rethink where we want to go in the long run. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Swinnon and all of our speakers for sharing your expertise and insights into the current crisis. Um, I am grateful to be reminded of how US government leadership helped the world bounce back from the 2007, 2008 crises. Uh, this is not to suggest that it is the role of the US government to fix everything, but the importance of leadership. Uh, and we certainly need that leadership more than ever today. Uh, from 2007, 2008, on the administration side, for example, first at the L'Aquila Food Security Initiative, and then the G7 in 2009, where they committed to launch Feed the Future. On the congressional side, through appropriations, authorizing the Global Food Security Act, and creating the GHP Nutrition Subaccount as its own funding account. Those things made a difference then, and have become core to how we successfully address hunger and malnutrition around the world with outstanding effectiveness and efficiency. We know what works and how to do it. And right now the US government could do two things that would have immediate and lasting impact on the current global food crisis. Number one, provide robust emergency supplemental funding to address the immediate global hunger and malnutrition needs. And two, to continue and increase support for core development programs focused on food and nutrition security, such as Feed the Future authorized through the GFSA. A congressional hearing would also be beneficial, focus on the growing food and nutrition insecurity crisis and how global conflict, pandemic and climate change and costs contribute to these crises. A US AID and State Department officials could brief on development and humanitarian action and how bilateral and multilateral investments combat crises. Country level perspectives could also be represented. Uh, this kind of hearing would raise the profile of this issue and put us on a path to more informed concrete action. So keeping in mind the presentations we've heard today from our three experts and leaders about the pre-invasion humanitarian crises, the situation now, what happened in the last decade that we might learn from and emulate and the practical options for next steps. I think it will be appropriate now for us to move to the Q&A portion uh, with our guests. Uh, what I'd like to do, uh, uh, is to maybe address a question to one particular person and then open it up to others if there are things that perhaps you may want to add or contribute. Uh, Dr. Hussein, I'll begin with you if I may. Uh, Jenny from the Helen Keller International asked in the chat, how do we expect these crises to affect the availability of food for those most at risk for hunger and malnutrition outside of Ukraine including those countries experiencing conflicts such as Afghanistan, Yemen, Tigray, and Ethiopia, et cetera. Uh, what is needed to try to mitigate the effects of these crises on the most vulnerable communities globally? Dr. Hussain. Thank you, Eugene. Um, let me just say that there are, there are, in my head, there are, there are two solutions. One is a political solution. If we say that the conflict is the root cause of many of these things which are going on, uh, why would the consequences of go away unless the conflict goes away? 
So first, on the political side, I think it is about time that you know many of these wars they need to end, because the consequences of those wars are not only devastating for people in those regions, but worldwide. So so that's the first thing on the political side. But till we get to that day and to that point, we need to help, and we need to help not only save people's lives but also change people's lives. And if we are able to do that, not as something as somebody else's problem, but as our problem, because we experience often the consequences of that, I think we, we can get somewhere. Ukraine is a classic example of making us essentially realize that we live in an interconnected world where something happens in one place and we see the repercussions of that around the world. And that those repercussions don't spare the children, they don't spare women and they don't spare men. So, so if you're not gonna do it, if we are not gonna do it for them, let's do it for ourselves, but please do it. Thank you so much. Um, others, would you want to chime in? Any uh, things that you'd like to contribute to that question? No, only to, to add something uh, straightforward. So the, the problem we face right now in this war, uh, indifferent to other conflicts that are happening in the world, is the fact that these are two key exporting countries of significant cereals and commodities, and especially of fertilizer. So the, 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 res the result is clear. It's the import bill of whatever, import bill of the countries, which are at risk, but also the money that the agencies have, like the WFP, to be able to supply the food that automatically changes. The re in real terms, it, it, they deplete their capacity, and therefore, that affects how much you can do. And also, these type of problems uh, could move the attention. Uh, and that's why it's important uh, that we look at the overall picture, not only at the problem in Ukraine, which is sad and terrible, but we need to look at the overall picture and don't forget that Afghanistan's, Yemen's, and Sudan's, and Lebanon are facing significant challenge uh, on people that are in critical situations. So, so it's very important not to lose focus here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me just add, I mean, the point is what we have done at IFPRI, I mean, is we are a research institution. We have analyzed the impact of, of the current uh, food price problems on several countries, including uh, as, uh, Yemen, Sudan, but also Myanmar, for example. And these are all countries where there's significant domestic conflict. And so some of these, uh, our, our local teams show that, that basically the local conflicts are actually at this point just as important or even more important in terms of affecting food security than, than the global uh, conflict, which, or let's say the Ukraine Russia conflict, which is spreading through the global markets. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Swinnon. Um, I'd like to maybe direct the next question uh, to you and then again open it up to others. Uh, Daisy Francis from Interaction asked the following question earlier In addition to the increased hunger and famine, rates of malnutrition are rising. Uh, what are you projecting in terms of developmental impacts on children and youth who are experiencing this crisis during the most critical phases of their development? The likely losses for the next generation hovers over this crisis. Uh, Dr. Swinnon, some thoughts from you, and then we'll open it up to others. Yeah, we, the, in a way, the answer is simple, okay? The dynamic effects, the, the long-term effects can be very severe. And we know that there's been now a whole series of studies how uh, food deprivation in young, uh, at the young age is really having long-term effects on, on people's development. We also know, for example, in, in, in terms of when we think about this conflict and also in the COVID situation, which was not so much displacement there, but a lot of uh, children could not go to school. And we know also there and that this has a long term detrimental effect on the development, on opportunities to find good jobs later in life, etc. So the, the, the intertemporal effects, the longer term effects can be much more severe than the short term effects, certainly. Dr. Hussein, I saw you unmute yourself and perhaps you want to contribute to this as well. Yeah, so so obviously, I mean, you know, if you're spending more than 50% of your income on, on food on a good day, and suddenly you're, you're, you're supposed to deal with the shock like this, uh, the, you know, the cuts come to, to, to the health and the education side. It is, it is just, it's common sense, right? I think what is also important is that 
what can be done about this, right? And I, in my head, programs like McGovern Dole, um, you know, take extraordinary significance in situations like this. Uh, McGovern Dole, if I'm not mistaken, is, is, is working in 40 countries. We are partners in that in about 10 countries. And I think it is important to scale that up even more because it not only provides a safety net for children, but it also is something which builds resilience of the next generation. And that should not be forgotten at a time like this. Thank mm. you. Yeah. Dr. Colin? Yeah, only this is Sub-Saharan Africa, and these are the key nutritional indicators, stunting, overweight, uh, wasting, uh, anemia in women and adult obesity and orange and yellow and all orange and red are off track and worsening and off track and no progress. So uh, here the issue is in the short term, of course, but there is an intertemporal issue, both in terms of chronic undernourishment and will affect cognitive ability of people. And there are papers working on the cost of that, uh, but also the overweight and obesity, because as prices goes up, the quality of the diet deteriorate. And that will have future health effects also that we need to take into account, the non-communicable diseases. Uh, thank you. Um, Dr. Cullen, I'm gonna go ahead and direct the next question for you. Uh, Kadar from the Gates Foundation asks, uh, we know that in a food insecure environment, the effects in vulnerable women and children are particularly dire. The prices of nutritious foods, for example, dairy, fruit and vegetables, meats, have also been elevated since the beginning of the pandemic. When considering these macro level proposals on trade and production, I'm wondering what is being put forward to better target and address the nutritional needs, both in the short and medium term of these groups outside of emergency assistance and support to production import of staple crops. Okay, so, so two, two elements. First, we knew from COVID-19 that the major sectors in the, in the agri-food systems, uh, and we call it agri-food system because the agricultural sector not only produces food, it also produces fibers and, and, and fuel and so on, uh, were mostly sectors that were, have a higher intensity of labor or female labor. And they were the most affected uh, compared to male in terms of the distribution of the impacts of COVID-19. Now, uh, to go directly to the question that you are saying, uh, today, um, you can always improve the targeting of programs and you can always try to, to find mechanisms like what we are proposing to do a subnational fee is to identify the new hotspots, which in COVID-19 was something necessary because the new hotspots spots of food insecurity were not the same. And therefore the transfers and the cash transfer programs not necessarily were targeting the same needed people. But one of the major problems that we face today in terms of micronutrients information is that we know the supply. So we know what the world can supply in terms of, of cereals and vegetables and fruits. We know how many uh, food groups are produced in the country and why trade is so important. Like in Africa, uh, the share of food groups that are needed for a healthy diet is, is not there. And therefore, if you don't have trade, it's impossible to achieve it. But we don't know well the demand what is the demand of micronutrients. And we're working uh, with our nutrition division and the statistics department to try to collect all the data so that we can have both the supply and the demand. And that will be very helpful because will allow us to look at the gaps. Uh, clearly today without trade, we cannot resolve the problem. But once we know better the gaps between the demand of micronutrients and the supply, I think we can do more targeted interventions that will allow us to resolve better the problem. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Hussein, I'm gonna direct the next question to you. It's uh, WFP specific. Uh, Lynn Brown from the Harvest Plus asks, every time food prices rise, WFP is hit with higher expenses for its current programs. Mm -hmm. What can be done? What governance policy changes could be implemented by the leadership board to protect WFP from significant price rise impacts to provide a measure of mitigation or insurance to you? Good question. And like I said in my presentation, we are looking at 44% uh, higher prices um, today than in 2019, uh, which very quickly turns into big figures. I think one, one thing which can be done, and we're really pushing in uh, for that, and, and people are, uh, are, are accepting that, uh, is uh, minimizing the tra transaction costs, uh, you know, uh, whether it be, be 
um, because of export bans or import subsidies or because of extraordinary taxes, you know, taking that away from humanitarian assistance is one way of bringing the transaction costs down. But also I think, don't forget the role of the private sector. I think this is a crisis where we need to bring different partners, non-traditional partners up, whether it be the private sector, whether it be the IFIs, whether it be the just people basically, to make sure that we, at the end of the day, we are able to assist people who cannot afford it, but also make food affordable in these places. I don't think, you know, sometimes we talk about high prices and low prices. I think we should be talking about purchasing power and affordability of food. Because what does high price mean? What does low price mean? It depends on how much money you have, right? So anything which allows us, any policies which allows us to bring the transaction costs down and make food affordable for, for, for people in these, these places is something which is, which is welcome. And we should realize that no single government, no single entity can do it. We need to get together on this and make sure that we involve private sector in this if we really truly want to get ahead. Over. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Dr. Swinnon, I'm just gonna ask a question. Uh, this is from Phil Karsting from the World Food Program. Uh, again, to you, but open to all, all of you here. The EU's farm to fork strategy has been paused in recognition of the challenges that lie ahead. What impact will shortages have on global acceptance of new technologies? For example, the CRSPR across Europe and the rest of the world. Any insight on that? Uh, yes, I think the, um, there's two aspects there. One is that it is certainly true that the current situation has had an impact on the farm to fork strategy or the implementation of the farm to fork strategy, I would say. And so this is actually similar to how the 2007-2008 price pact affected the, the policy discussions, I mean, uh, about a decade ago. And, and so a similar effect happened. I think there's a really significant potential impact on, on the sustainability drive of the, of the European food system. And I think that's, that's a very unwelcome development. On the other hand, I think this the CRISPR technologies, et cetera, is, is a bit of a separate issue. And, it actually may be enhanced by the development, that, sorry, that the, the CRISPR is, is at this point put in the same category as the GMO classification and kind of blocked by the regulations. And I think maybe the current crisis may help to unblock that to show that this type of technologies can really play a very important role, both for the, the, the supply side, but also for dealing with uh, climate change, with uh, resilience issues, et cetera. Thank you. Others uh, interested in that question? Yes. Uh, only only to, to add with what Joe said. So basically, I think uh, there are three technological revolutions that will happen. Uh, one, of course, is automation, which is already happening. And that will put a stress in the labor force. And we need to be careful with that. Uh, it's happening across the board. It's not just in developed countries. It's happening in developing countries. The second one, of course, is related to resistance to weather and to climate, uh, and that's where gene editing and other technologies will play a role, as, as Joe mentioned, and that is already moving forward, and the Europeans will be flexible, flexibilize what, what they are doing right now. Uh, and, of course, there we need to be extremely careful on, 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 on having the institutionality in place. So the institutions is important and in both uh, the automation with digital technologies and in, in any uh, gene editing or any other innovation on this sense, we need to have the governance mechanisms to assure that countries are prepared to handle this properly. And, and, and the third one will be linked more to the fertilizer world. I think uh, there is a lot of work going on right now in an accelerated way to find alternatives to fertilizer, which not necessarily are organic alternatives, which are more complex and could take longer, but are more chemical uh, solutions like hydrogen and combinations that will allow us to find better substitutes in the short term. Thank you very much. Um, I am going to direct us to our last question. I know a few more questions are trickling in and we'll tend to them post event, but I wanna make sure that we have ample time for our last question. And this is obviously for each panelist and want to give you sufficient time to respond. Um, we are joined here by uh, many members of uh, Hill staffers. And if you could share just one key message 
for senators and Hill staff in terms of next steps or action items, uh, what would you like to say? Um, so I'm gonna begin with Dr. Hussein. We'll go to Dr. Cullen and then end with Dr. Squinnan. Uh, Dr. Hussein. I would say for me, I mean, uh, what I would say is that right now the biggest constraint uh, is financing, is funding. Um, like I said, um, as we speak, we are looking at over 50% gap. This is an unsustainable gap. It is nothing like what we have seen in the past. And the situation is not like what we have seen in the past. And just to take a minute on that, what I mean by that is that, you know, there have always been funding gaps before also. So it's nothing new in terms of, of the gap itself. But because of COVID, what has happened is that if you were a person getting assistance, you're not getting cut by one source, one entity. Your government is cutting you, your UN agencies are cutting you, your other NGOs are cutting you. And on top of that, then you see World Food Program as your last resort is also cutting you. So the point here, what we are trying to make is that even if it is as one-time exceptional, um, donation, please do it and make sure that we have enough resources so we are not looking at that big of a significant gap because the cost of that gap when not filled, whether it be in Afghanistan, whether it be in Yemen, whether it be in South Sudan, is, is several times more just a few more months later. So that's that would be my message. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Colin. Yeah, three things. Uh, first, carefully look at the import facility technical document we have in the webpage. I think it's central and it could help with a small share of the SDRs right now in the IMF uh, to avoid a uh, food crisis moving into social unrest, which will be dramatic. And that could be a way to help countries which are in a critical situation. Second, uh, don't jump into trillions of, of policies without looking at the history uh, and what we have learned that doesn't work. It's very important that we assess the, the, what is going to be implemented very fast. It can be done very fast because we have evidence already uh, and, and analyzing the trade-offs of, of the policies being implemented will be, will be central. Uh, and this applies in the short, medium and long term, including climate change. We need to be careful how we implement those policies. Uh, and the third thing is that uh, we need to uh, to find a way in which we support initiatives that are already successful, like the agricultural market information system and others that have shown success rather than creating new initiatives that will make them lose power, which is something that will be dramatic uh, right now. Thank you so much, Dr. Swinnon. Yeah, I would, um, I think the, the, the big, I would say the big uh, point or big message I would say is for, for for the United States to stay engaged and take leadership in many of the global issues related to the current crisis. I'm thinking about trade, climate, the finance issues that Maxwell referred to, development uh, engagements, et cetera. And I think more specifically, and this relates to the work that we are doing as well, I think USAID is doing a fantastic job in working with local governments in developing countries and uh, setting up advisory systems, monitoring systems, uh, and a number of things, uh, including through its uh, Bureau for Food Security and Resilience, but also the local missions. And I think that's a really crucial way of, of staying engaged and really having a lot of impact on the ground through a number of, of local programs and initiatives related also to nutrition, food safety, gender programs, etc., which are extremely important and even more important now, I think, in this crisis situation. Thank you so much. Uh, for those that may have joined in the middle of our program, I had introduced myself and I, I'm a Reverend Eugene Cho. And as some of you may know, this week is Holy Week. It's the most significant week for those who participate uh, in the Christian calendar. And I have been thinking about this word hope during this time when it feels and we see with our own eyes some of the hopelessness uh, and yet, I think we can acknowledge that while there are many, many challenges, that there is hope and that we need to stay engaged, as Dr. Swinnon said, and take leadership. I want to thank uh, uh, our participants for their questions and for your attention over the past 
80 or so minutes. And again, so much gratitude and thanks to our wonderful panelists for being so informative. Uh, we will do our best to follow up with any questions left unanswered. Uh, and you're also welcome to reach out to me at Eugene Cho at bread.org or to any member of the US CEO Council for Nutrition to speak more. Uh, may God bless you and the work that you do, that we do together to alleviate hunger, malnutrition, and poverty in our nations and around the world. Thank you again. Blessings. Thank you.